This is breaking news from News 3. Thank you for joining us. We have incredible news out of northwestern Wisconsin tonight. After disappearing nearly three months ago, Jamie Kloss has been found alive in the town of Gordon around 445 this afternoon. A suspect was taken into custody shortly thereafter. The 13 year old disappeared back on October 15th after her parents were found shot to death inside their barren home. Our Amy Reed has been following the very latest updates and she joins us now in studio. Amy. Yeah, this is a story we've been following for months. Tonight, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department in far northern Wisconsin along Lake Superior notified Barron County deputies that they located Jamie Kloss safe. Throughout this investigation, details were very limited. Even tonight, it's being called an active situation. In the days after she went missing, hundreds of volunteers spent days combing the area looking for clues. At one point, Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald even asked deer hunters to keep an eye out for suspicious activity in the woods. Law enforcement agents had received thousands of tips from across the country. We don't know how they learned she was in Douglas County. The FBI has offered a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Tonight, we do not know who was taken into custody, but we do know Jamie Kloss has been found alive. Amy Reed sharing that incredibly good news tonight. Amy, thank you. And the Barron County Sheriff's Department will be holding a press briefing tomorrow morning at 10, and we will carry that briefing in its entirety at channel3000.com. CBS This Morning will also be sending a team to Barron, so they will have continued coverage tomorrow after News 3 this morning. Next at 10, OSHA announces two companies committed serious violations leading to the Sun Prairie explosion. Inspectors say Bear Communications and some contractor VC Tech failed to contact underground utility owners or the digging hotline. Improper drilling into a gas line led to the explosion that killed Fire Captain Corey Barr. OSHA slapped both companies with a fine of $12,934. While that is the maximum penalty, Sun Prairie's mayor says it's, quote, almost nothing. I'm almost speechless in that regard. I just don't know what to make of it. I suppose OSHA lives within its rules, and maybe that determines the level of fines. I guess that's the case. You would think if there were ever a case where a massive fine was called for, this would be the place because their heirs caused somebody to die. Could there be anything more extreme than that? I don't think so. Bear Communications and VC Tech have 15 days to pay the fine, request a conference with OSHA, or contest the fine. Bear Communications declined to comment. VC Tech could not be reached. New at 10, we are looking into how common gas leaks are in our area and what precautions should be taken. Our Madeline O'Neill is back from McFarland, where two gas leaks in the span of three weeks has one household questioning the digging process. Maddie? Well, what happened in Sun Prairie shows how serious gas leaks can be. So a family in McFarland that was evacuated not once, but twice in the past few weeks wants to make sure any digging work is being done right. Well, it was weird. It first happened December 20th, the day off for Lisa Grady. Come here. And her two dogs. Sit. She was cooking with her gas stove, not expecting a knock on her door telling her to evacuate because of a gas leak. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, I've got to get my dogs out. Then on Wednesday, three weeks later. Okay, not once, but twice. Grady's household was evacuated again. Well, the second time, you know, it was a little disgusted because it's like, well, seriously? How does this happen? TDS Telecommunications is installing a fiber optic network. According to the company, the gas line locates were accurate. But the first hit happened when a TDS contractor dug too hard with a shovel. The second time, the contractor hit the gas main in the process of digging a hole to access underground lines. My first thought was, were my dogs. I'm like, well, if I wasn't home, what would have happened? And they're just like, well, we would have, you know, just shut off the gas and so forth. I'm like, my dogs, what, would have blown up? What? TDS says the company works closely with contractors to train safety protocols. And while there's always a risk to digging underground, they say contractors use caution digging and locating lines. In both cases, Alliant Energy crews repaired the damage to their gas line. A spokesperson with Alliant says while it is not common for a gas line to be damaged twice in a three-week time span in the same project, it does happen and is not out of the ordinary. We sit. Grady wants to see more vetting of the people doing work outside her home. I don't want to be disparaging of people and their qualifications, but for whatever reason, it seems like they could do a better job. Because for her, it's not so much about what happened, 
as it is what could have. You're just more aware, especially since some prairie. That's, you know, it's like, well, heck, it, it could have been. And it wasn't, thankfully. We wanted to know how common gas leaks are, so we asked energy companies in our area. In 2017, Alliant Energy reports 104 gas leaks. MG&E had 89. Both companies have about 5,000 miles of service lines. We Energy saw about 600. They have nearly 1 million miles of gas service lines in the area they cover. Now, the term gas leak encompasses anything from someone nicking a service line while digging in their backyard to a high-pressure gas main getting hit during a big construction project. So it's kind of a big range there, too. Madeline O'Neill reporting tonight. Thank you, Madeline. An investigation underway in Walworth County, but information there very limited. We know there was a large police presence. This is at a home on County Road J in the town of East Troy. Police Please tell us it is still an active situation. They say the public is not in any danger. We asked police if there were any deaths involved, but they could not confirm nor deny that. This incident, they told us, and we understand through the Barron County Sheriff's Department, was not at all related to the Jamie Kloss investigation. We also hope to learn more information about what's happening in this Walworth County case sometime tomorrow. To weather now, meteorologist Dana Fulton is on the backyard patio with our first alert forecast. Hi, Dana. Hey, it is a little chilly outside for us right now, as was the forecast for this afternoon. But overall, we're actually pretty average today, hitting a high of 26 degrees. It was right where we should be if you had to design a January day temperature wise and with the sky conditions. Uh, we were pretty on point today. Now we're only going to go up from here heading into the weekend. Temps are going to become more mild overnight tonight. We'll hover close to 20. We're really not going to get much cooler than where we're at right now. So that's my good news for your Friday morning. Notice our breeze has started to shift directions. Also, it's coming from the southeast now rather than from the north and in the single digits. So your wind chill certainly a little bit of a factor, but not nearly as much of a factor as what we had this morning nor for yesterday. So this breeze again staying calm for your morning heading into Friday. Uh, overall, we're expecting a partly cloudy sky tonight. No threat for any sort of flurries moving in. We have some flurries to the northern portion of the state, but we're going to hold off on any flurry action for us in the southern edge. Overall, we will get some sunshine tomorrow. We'll be in the mid 30s for our afternoon highs, and that's where we will stay as we head towards Saturday and Sunday. But we'll take a closer look at what's ahead for the weekend and your full 10-day forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Dana, thank you. And with temperatures dipping this week, homeless shelters in Madison are welcoming in more people. Porchlight isn't turning anyone away, and they've made sure to open their overflow spaces to make sure they have room this year, working with a day shelter to make sure there is always a place to go. We recently changed our hours to coincide with the beacon uh, so that uh, you know, our guests are out in the cold as little as possible. Literally, the time that the beacon closes is the time that we open and vice versa in the morning. Well, right now, Porchlight working to gear up for their guests for when they aren't in the shelter, collecting things like coats, hats, gloves, and boots. A Milwaukee County Transit System bus driver honored today for a special act of kindness. Irina Ivick was on her route when she saw a baby wearing only a diaper and a onesie walking alone on a freeway overpass. It was 8 in the morning. The temperature at the time below freezing. She stopped her bus, ran across the street, and carried the youngster back to the warm bus and then called for help. Police say the child had been left outside by mother, was later reunited with his father. Milwaukee Transit says this is the ninth lost or missing child drivers have found in recent years. President Trump's former lawyer Michael Cohen will testify publicly before the House Oversight Committee next month. Cohen has agreed to the public testimony on February 7th. Cohen is coming to Capitol Hill after he pleaded guilty and was sentenced in December to three years in prison on multiple campaign violation charges. President Trump went to South Texas today to visit a border station and push the case for his wall. He said miles of open border allow drug and human traffickers to come and go as they please. With the standoff between the White House and Democratic leaders only intensifying, the question now, will the president declare a national emergency to sidestep Congress and fund a wall? Are you, are you closer to declaring an emergency? We are. I would like to look at broader. I think we can do this quickly because this is common sense and it's not expensive. South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham released a statement saying it is time for the president to use those emergency powers. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi criticized Republicans for rejecting Democratic funding bills that would reopen several government agencies. We want to work. We want to work. 
Across the country, federal workers rallied in several cities to demand an immediate end to the partial government shutdown. It's already the second longest government shutdown in history, and on Saturday, it's likely to become the longest. For many government employees, the shutdown will really hit home tomorrow when payday comes and there is no check. In much of Wisconsin, high school sports are a very big deal, but the WIAA wrote in a recent op-ed that some parents are getting a bit too involved, even discouraging referees from continuing their jobs. Chris Lewinberg tells us more. It's new tonight at 10. All right, shake hands, guys. The sound of the courts is what keeps Justin Offger reffing after this long. 15 years. Um, I just love being on the court because I used to play varsity basketball, so I really enjoy just being on the court with, with the kids. While the cheering in the crowds are what make the atmosphere. And I just love basketball. It can sometimes get out of hand. Like I was reffing and the, the, the fan almost came out on the court and you know was, was yelling at me and I'm like, I don't get paid enough for this. <laughs> and you can't hear the sound of the courts through the ringing in your ears. Some days, you feel like you, I have a bad game and, you know, the coaches are you know, a little more on you, yelling at you, or the fans. That's, that's pretty hard. And sometimes I wonder, why do I still do this? It's these incidents that the WIAA says turns refs away in an op-ed they released earlier today, asking parents to cool it. People don't holler at the, at the bus driver. People don't holler at the secretary in the office. People don't holler that way. Uh, at the teachers. Judgments have to be made, and you, you've got to accept that. That's what competitive athletics is all about. And the effect this behavior has can make an impact. I think it's, it's trending to more involvement, more of these kinds of instances than uh, uh, we would like to have. And it's, it's very difficult, though, to be critical of parents who follow their kids because too often we have kids that never have a parent at a game. All Ofger wants is to hear the sound of the court. <laughs> and not the anger of some parents. Just, you know, just res more, more respect for the officials because what people and fans don't know if there's no officials, there's no game. I'm Chris Lewenberg, WISC News 3. And Chickering says retaining referees is difficult for a number of other reasons as well, including pay and the behavior of the coaches. Still ahead tonight, the Piano Man is coming to Miller Park this spring. And plus, how a pair of new laws could help reduce the cost for your prescriptions. Some money-saving tips next at 10.
Billy Joel will be performing this spring at Miller Park. The Brewers say he will perform on Friday, April 26th. To tickets go on sale Monday to American Express card holders, and then they'll be available to the general public at 10 a.m. January 18th. Billy Joel hasn't been to Milwaukee in 11 years and has never performed at Miller Park. Americans spend more on drugs than people in any other country. The amount of out-of-pocket is projected to rise to $67 billion in 2025 from about $25 billion in 2000. And now two new bills banning drug gag clauses can help reduce the cost. Consumer Reports has the way to save for cheaper meds, and all you have to do is ask. Leah Linshide reports. A March 2018 study found that for about one out of five prescriptions, insurers required people to pay more using their insurance than if they paid the pharmacy's retail price. One reason this happened, gag clauses. Those clauses prevented pharmacists from telling you there may be a lower price by not using your insurance. But not anymore. Gag clauses were something that Consumer Reports surfaced about five years ago. We worked with a lot of state legislators to help pass state by state laws to help curtail this practice. And then, this past October, two bills were passed in Congress that put an end to this practice at a national level, which is a terrific win for consumers. We can actually help the consumer a whole lot more. For example, last night, a lady came in for an antibiotic ointment. We filled it, ran it through her insurance. It was $192. Put it through for the cash price, and it was just $15. The number one thing to do is ask, is this the lowest possible price on my medication? There are some other ways to be money smart with meds, and Consumer Reports health editor Lisa Gill breaks them down. Make sure that you're taking a generic. Generics are an, a terrific option for most people and will save you boatloads of money. Ask, hey, can I get a three-month prescription or a 90-day fill instead of just a 30-day fill? You typically can save at least one copay, sometimes two. Another way to put the power in your pocketbook, check out websites that offer coupons. For WISC News 3, this is Leah Lynchide. Well, time to take a look at our forecast now. Dana Fulton joining us, and things should be warming up a little bit, Dana. Warming up a little bit and still staying fairly quiet for us, actually. Looking throughout southern Wisconsin right now, we're, we're going to stay pretty calm this evening. It is cool outside right now, but it is going to be much more mild as we head to the weekend. Our high pressure is shifting east for us, so our breeze becoming more southerly overnight. That's warmer air moving in, and you're going to notice in the next few days how our temperatures just continue to climb up a little bit almost every single day. Even in the last 24 hours, we've jumped about five degrees in Madison, four in Mineral Point, and in Platteville. If you think that jump is uh, familiar at this point, you're, you're pretty right. It's been a long time since our temperatures have been in the single digits. In fact, it's been almost 330 days and counting because our 10 day doesn't include any drops down to the single digits since the last time that we were that cold. And the last time that we went this far into winter without dropping below 10 was actually in 1914. We went to January 11th. Uh, at this point, it doesn't look like we're going to hit it any time in the next 10 days, but again, 330 days, quite a long time for us. It has been fairly mild for the last several weeks, and it does look like we are going to continue to stay pretty mild. We're also a little short on our snowfall total. Only this year we've picked up just under 10 inches, and we should be over 21 inches. That's our average uh, for us for this time of year. So it, we do have a few more months of uh, potentially could make up that difference, but honestly, we usually see the most snowfall during the beginning of our winter. So to make up that deficit, plus of course our season normal of 50 inches, just doesn't seem so likely for us right now, but we'll see how February, March play out. We still have a lot of time overnight. We are going to stay calm. Our temps will not move around too much. We'll stay close to 20 to start off the day, and then our afternoon highs will be in the mid 30s. So a 10 degree jump for where we're at today. Variably cloudy for Saturday and overall on Saturday. There is a slight chance for flurries, but that chance is south of Madison and not looking very good currently. Partly cloudy for your overnight hours. Not as cold. Again, our temps are going to hover close to 24 overnight lows. 35 is what we're planning for your high tomorrow and we're going to stay in the mid to low 30s actually as we get into the weekend our, our highs don't change too much our overnight lows are going to stay into the 20s and at the start of next week we still have some sunshine uh, not really including much of a chance for snowfall until we get maybe towards the end of next week but even that doesn't seem to have a great deal of moisture associated with it so the general trend
trend right now is uh, mild and calm for the middle of January. Not bad, Dana. Not bad at all. Dana, thank you. Mm -hmm. Coming up in sports, a pair of Badger senior football players will play one more game wearing that motion W. Kevin will explain next. There's still a long way to go, but the winner of tonight's game of the week between Stoughton and Monona Grove will grab the early inside track to a conference crown. It's always these two in the conversation. Silver Eagles trying to avoid a second straight home loss. Stoughton's Adam Hobson. His range is when he gets in the gym. From about 26, buries a three and puts the visitors up three. Monona Grove inbound. Jordan Bishop catches, scoops, scores. 61-60 Silver Eagles. Tied at 61 late. Caden Nelson, less than five to go. Can't hit. Now on the rebound, a foul called on Stoughton. Kyle Nett goes to the line with .6 to go. Makes the first, makes the second. One more chance for Stoughton. Decent look, Hobson doesn't get it off in time, doesn't go anyway. MG holds on to win 63-61. Two late free throws gives Monona Grove an exciting win over Stoughton, and uh, Kyle Nett was the guy that made the free throws. Well, what's it like to stand up at the free throw line with the game on the line? Just got to stay calm, ignore all the noise, and just put them down. 
And you knew they were in as soon as they left your hand? Yep. Pretty much? Yep, confident all the way. Yeah. Uh, how about this win from Monona Grove uh, against your great rival from Stone? I mean, the, this conference race has come down to these two teams for so often. What's what's the meaning of, of getting a big win like that? It's a big win. We've been working pretty hard, and it means a lot to us. Yeah. And uh, what's, what was the uh, celebration like in the locker room? It was good. <laughs> That's it? Intense. It, yeah, was it was good? good? It was good. It's got to be better than good. Yeah. yeah. Kyle, thanks very much. Monona Grove with a big win tonight. Packers head coach Matt LaFleur wasting no time making personnel moves with regard to his staff, firing special teams coach Ron Zook one day in. Zook was hired as assistant special teams coach in 2014, promoted in 2015, but never really put things together. They weren't very good on kickoffs or punts. That's kind of the point. Green Bay ranked 28th in special teams last season. Taiwan Deals, one of two Badgers who will try to impress NFL scouts in a couple of weeks, been picked to play in the NFL Players Association Collegiate Bowl. Deal worked through injuries in his career, but rushed for 545 yards, six touchdowns this season, finished his Badger career with 1,212 yards and 12 touchdowns. Rafael Gaglianone had to work through a bad back the last couple seasons, but when he's on, he's on. The Brazilian kickers also headed to the Collegiate Bowl, hit just 10 of 17 as a senior, but his 70 career field goals, most all-time at UW, his four game winners, also the most in school history. The Collegiate Bowl, Saturday, January 19th at the Rose Bowl. The Brewers had some money left, so they did some post-holiday spending, signing catcher Yasmani Grandal, one year, 18.25 million bucks. The normally sure-handed Grandal got benched against the Brewers in the postseason because he had fielding issues, but the 30-year-old switch hitter, Ken Hit, has 20 or more homers in three straight seasons. Well, there's something in the water at Westlake High School, Austin, Texas, because this weekend, the Eagles travel to New Orleans to meet the Saints in the playoffs. Both starting quarterbacks, Drew Brees and Nick Foles, once played for the Chaparrales. Brees led the team to a state title in 1996. Foles, with a great head of hair, broke Brees' passing yardage and touchdown records en route to a state runner-up finish 10 years later. One more break, and then we are back.
An update to our breaking news tonight. Jamie Kloss, the Barron County 13-year-old who has been missing since mid-October, has been found alive in Douglas County, northern Wisconsin. The Sheriff's Department says she was found about 4.45 p.m. today. The suspect was arrested a short while later. Both of Jamie's parents were found shot to death in their Barron home on October 15th. Our Danica Lewis will begin our coverage in Barron starting on News 3 this morning. The Sheriff's Office has scheduled a news conference for tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We will carry that live on WISC TV 3 and on Channel 3000.com. We want to go to Dana. One final check of the forecast. We're expecting a very mild weekend. Your Friday is going to include some sunshine for us. There is a chance, very slight chance for some flurries coming in late Friday night and for Saturday. Um, much of that's going to be south of Madison and any accumulation will just be a dusting. But notice those temperatures well above average of the 30s through the rest of the week. Thanks for joining us. Do something good and we'll see you tomorrow.